Online, welcome. Thank you for being here um, with us today. Just wanted to give you a quick update. Um, some of you have asked about my daughter, Andrea, and how everything went. I just I can't even begin to tell you um, how grateful we are, um, how well things went. I was thinking of this song, There's Joy in the House of the Lord, and I thought, well, there's joy in our house. Amen. There's joy in our house, and for goodness so. She had surgery on Monday, and, and uh, they, for those of you who didn't hear, they removed a 22-pound ovarian cyst, which is just hard to imagine. I mean, I mean, we're talking about a little person, a little petite person is Andrea, and uh, crazy, crazy, but she weighs a lot less than <laughs> she did when she went in. But uh, we're so grateful because it was benign, it was uh, non-cancerous, and so just getting her healed up, and she's doing great, she's watching today, so hello Andrea, yeah, they're all waving at you. Um, we, you know, we'll obviously tell you more later how grateful we are, I just really, we just cannot express to you how grateful and thankful we are for our church family. You all have reached out to us. It's just so cool getting texts from people because I think everybody has my number. I give it to everybody. Um, <laughs> just is what it is, you know. So I get in texts all over the place from people checking and just saying we're praying for you. And I'm like, what? You know, and it was just so neat. Uh, all the people checking in and wanting to know how she's doing and telling us, man, we love your daughter. And I know, but what about me? You don't love me? It's a, no. Yeah, no, but I mean, she, she is. She's just, you know, my kids, you guys have always been so supportive. And um, we are just extremely grateful, extremely grateful for what happened and how well she's doing and just getting, getting better and better each and every day. And it's all because of you and your prayers and God's kindness to us, and we appreciate it. So thank you. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you. But she'll be back up here singing and doing what she does best just as soon as she can. All right. I'm trying to think of anything else. I think that's it. All right. All right. Want to hear a funny story? I want to do something funny. All right. So I heard about this elderly minister who had faithfully pastored for almost 50 years and he was close to death and he sent word for two of his church members to come to his house and be by his side as he faced the final moments of his life on this earth. One was a lawyer and the other was an IRS agent. Upon arrival he motioned that he wanted one to stand on his, on his right side and one to stand on the left side of his bed and they were both very moved that he asked them to come to be by his side in the final moments of his life. A little perplexed but honestly sincerely touched that he would ask them to be there and not one of his children. The IRS agent asked him, sir, why did you choose both of us to be by your side in the final moments of your life. The pastor who was literally close to death and doing everything he could to answer responded, Jesus died between two thieves <laughs> and that's the way I want to leave this earth. <laughs> Why do they get such a bad rap? I don't know. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Anyway, well last week... In our time together, honestly, we barely cracked open the, the door to understanding the meaning of the words, the fear of God or the fear of the Lord. This is one of those topics that I think needs some filtering, um, so to speak, to be able to have the right perspective or the right attitude and the right understanding when it comes to being able to live our lives as the Bible tells us, with the fear of the Lord or as the fear of the Lord is in our life as a foundational key um, to the success of our world. The only filter that gives us 
as I can see, the best perspective of this particular idea is the Bible. The Bible is its own best interpreter. It gives its own best definition. There's man's view, then there's God's view. And some people say, well, here's the bird's eye view. Well, God's view is always above all of that. When you and I see these words in the Bible, um, I would like for you to be able to know and understand what that means for you as a child of God and what that means for people who are outside of the family of God. Because there are two different viewpoints when it comes to understanding the fear of the Lord. I think we would all agree that there should be a different view or meaning for those people who are children of God in understanding the fear of the Lord and for people who are not children of God in understanding the fear of the Lord. For Because of this, I think it's vitally important for us to know the difference between the fear of the Lord and being afraid of God. And to know what the fear of the Lord is and what the fear of the Lord is not. And most importantly, what did Jesus say about the fear of the Lord? When you and I have the proper and correct understanding or attitude about the fear of the Lord, there are some wonderful promises given to us by God in our relationship. And I'm going to mention a few of those today. As we saw last week in our, our text in Isaiah chapter 33, we saw the fear of the Lord, Isaiah saw the fear of the Lord as a positive thing and not a negative thing. In our world today, people hear that terminology, the fear of the Lord, and they immediately want to turn into a negative instead of understanding it in the light of the Word of God as a positive. Isaiah said this, he said, He said, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. He said, the fear of the Lord is the key to the store of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. I like the word store. Because I think that really puts that in something that you and I can relate to. It's like saying, if you want to get the opportunity to go shopping for some real treasure, you'll need the key to get into the door to go shopping. So instead of being a window shopper, And looking from the outside at all of the good things in the store, if you have the fear of the Lord, you have the key that opens the door to the good things that are inside. That is what God wants you to see. The writer of Proverbs we saw, he said the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that protects us from the traps that lead to death. That's a promise. If we have this particular attitude or viewpoint It protects us from the very things the enemy tries to snare us with. I like the word snare because the enemy is there to try to trap us or snare us into things that will be a detriment to our life instead of things that will be good for our life. In both cases, these writers consider the fear of the Lord as something that is extremely beneficial as a person who is connected or in relationship with God. With that said, let's just jump in and look at um, part two of this message, the fear of the Lord. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, and you want to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, I'm going to read just the beginning part of 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. This is one of those verses that uh, is just kind of a hidden jewel in the midst of the Old Testament that tells us a lot about God's heart. And he said this, he said, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I like what the New American Standard Bible says. It says, For the eyes of the Lord 
roam throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. The Bible tells us that God is looking for that person who is fully devoted, fully committed, or whose heart is loyal or completely his. He's looking for this person that he can stand by, that he can be strong through, that he can pour his blessings upon. He wants that to be available for every single one of us. When God finds this kind of a person, the the Word of God tells us He can do extraordinary things through them. What kind of a person is this? What type of a person is God looking for? Well, in answering that question, what we need to do is focus not on asking God to bless us or us trying to twist God's arm to give us something because the Bible tells us that He already did give us stuff. And if you're a child of God, we already have the blessing available to us in Christ. The Bible says because we're in Christ, He has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So they are there for us, but not everybody gets to experience them. But they're there. He has given them to us. What we need to focus on is becoming the person that God longs to bless. What we need to focus on is becoming the person that God longs to bless. This verse tells us that God is looking for a certain kind of attitude of the heart. And what is that type of attitude? Well, I believe that it's connected to our topic. I believe it's connected to this particular attitude and heart that God is looking for. Now, the question is, too, also, is how does this idea apply to the new creation person? How does this idea apply to you and I who are children of God, who have been born again, who have a spirit that is made new? The Bible tells us that we are one with God, that what is in Christ is, is in us, how does this apply to us? Well, I believe it's best seen by asking this question. Here's the question. Can you love God and not fear God? Can you love God and not fear God? Yes, you can. I believe you can. It's like Jesus being your Savior, but not your Lord. There's a difference between Jesus being and being recognized as the Lord and Jesus being your Lord or my Lord. There's a different perspective and a different attitude. That's why understanding what it means to fear the Lord is so important for you and I. So let's get running really fast this morning. I want to get through this stuff. Um, that I want to talk about. So let's look now at what the fear of the Lord is and what the fear of the Lord is not. Because this is important for us to understand. It's interesting when you look up the word for fear in the original languages of the Bible, which is Greek and Hebrew, the definition of the word is the same. It doesn't change the definition of the word. It's all a matter of context or what position you're in. The root word For fear is the same for everyone, but each person is in a different position. So that means there is a viewpoint of a believer, and then there is a viewpoint of a non-believer. In other words, there's a benefit for you and I who are in relationship with God when it comes to the fear of the Lord, and there is something completely different for those who are outside of a relationship with God when it comes to understanding the fear of the Lord. The root word for fear in the Greek is uh, the word phobos, I guess is how you would say it, P-H-O-B-O-S. And if you look it up, you can find this for yourself. It is defined as, number one, alarm, exceeding fear, and terror. Alarm, exceeding fear, and terror. But it's also defined as awe, reverence, and respect. 
awe, reverence, and respect. And when you look up the word awe, it means a feeling. This is interesting. It means a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. Interesting. It's two perspectives. It's a reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. What this is telling us is that that it's all a matter of viewpoint or positioning. It's a matter of viewpoint or positioning. It's like two people's viewpoint of the Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Two, point, two people's viewpoint in the Grand Canyon. One person's viewpoint while standing at the top, far from the edge, in safety and security, they see something completely different from the viewpoint that comes from a person who is hanging from the edge by a tree root at a, facing a thousand foot drop. Two different perspectives. Both have respect and both have awe. But one stands in wonder of the beauty they see from safety and security while the other is experiencing and sees exceeding fear and terror as they hang on to this root for the last literal seconds of their life. Same picture Unique viewpoint. It's the same definition. Awe, respect, mixed with fear. It's the same, but how they perceived it is all a matter of position and perspective. That's how it is with the fear of the Lord. How you view the fear of God is all a matter of your position and your perspective. The definition is the same. Before we go any further, I want to give you a definition of what the fear of the Lord is. And honestly, I I had to look at everything I had available to me, my commentaries, my books, my 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, which has a definition about this long, um, my Vines, my Strong Thayers, every kind of Bible assist thing that was available to me, and of course, going through as many possible scriptures as I can, the Old Testament, New Testament, to come up with what the Bible defines the fear of the Lord as. And I'm just telling you that because I want you to know I did the best to do my research and to come up with uh, the best viewpoint or meaning of the fear of the Lord for us as a Christian. And the reason I say us as a Christian, because listen, if you're not here, if you hear this morning, are not in relationship with God, you're going to have a completely different viewpoint. And honestly, you should. You should. Because standing in front of a perfect and holy God in your human effort is going to be scary. It's going to be scary. And honestly, any person that doesn't have any terror or fear, real terror and fear, to face God, the perfect God, on your own, something's wrong with you. So what is this? Let's look at this. So let me give you uh, the definition in just a second. It says, the fear of the Lord, now listen, number one, we need to understand what the fear of the Lord is not. The fear of the Lord is not to be frightened, afraid, or scared of God as a Christian. We should not be frightened, afraid, or scared of God. The, Timothy, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy said this, he said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Power and love, a sound mind. What is the fear of the Lord from a believer's perspective? From you and I, what is the fear of the Lord? And I gave you a little handout there that has it written down for you. And this is just where I'm at today and the way I see it. 
Doesn't mean this is obviously a perfect definition of it. And I don't know if there's any possible way to give a perfect human definition of this particular idea. But this is what I think. The fear of the Lord is a profound and continual love, respect, and reverence for God, His Word, and everything He alone declares as holy, righteous, and good. It is to uphold the infinite, all-powerful God in the highest place of honor in your life. The fear of the Lord is to deeply tremble in awe of His presence, His majesty, and the wonders of His person. The fear of the Lord is to worship God alone with passion, praise, and continual thanksgiving. The fear of the Lord is to honor what He honors, to love what He loves, and to hate what He hates. The fear of the Lord is to embrace His will, His purposes, and His kingdom as ours. The fear of the Lord is the eternal, all-encompassing heart's desire to be like Jesus in everything and in every way as Jesus did for His Father. That, to me, is really a brief introduction of what the fear of the Lord is for you and I. Well, let's look at some of the different scriptures uh, in the New Testament and see what Jesus and the first century apostles said about the fear of the Lord using our definition as a filter. And hopefully this will help you see how to apply this to your life and to your decision making. Because I believe that if we have a proper respect, awe, and um, reverence for God, it will affect the decisions that we make in life. And it should. Wouldn't you say amen to that? It should. Well, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you. Whom to fear? Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Some people might say, well, Jesus is talking to kind of Old Testament believers and not to you and I 2,000 years later in our day. Well, you know, that's fine if you want to think that. Well, I don't. I believe Jesus is saying, fear God. I think that's exactly what we need to do. We need to do what he said, is to fear God. The apostle Peter said this. He said, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. Honor the emperor, or another translation says, honor the king. A chapter before that, Peter said these words. He said, as obedient children... Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay in what? Fear. Conduct yourselves in the time of your stay here. And what is he talking about? And here in this world, doing what we do, he said, conduct yourselves in fear. In other words, that needs to be a motivation for what we do each and every day in our life. And he goes on and he connects the fear of the Lord with the holiness of God. You know, that's another topic that we can get into some time of understanding what holiness is in our world and what does holiness look like in a child of God? What what does that mean 
to be holy. It's interesting also that when you go through and you look at all of the words, fear, the fear of the Lord, it says the, the fear of the Lord is, is clean. That's what the psalmist said. The fear of the Lord is pure and it's clean. What in the world? It's clean. That's something you and I need to understand that what God's word does, the fear of the Lord purifies. It actually creates in us the very things that we want to become. That becomes the method of making us who um, God wants us to be. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He said, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. And what does he look here? Perfecting holiness... In the love of God. Perfect of holiness in what? The fear of God. And then this was my question. And you will, as you study this more, I encourage you on your own. You'll see there's a direct connection between the love of God and the fear of God. One actually produces the other. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you fear God. And if you fear God in the purest way, you love God. And here's what's interesting. I learned that from my father. And you you think, well, how did I learn that from my dad? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I learned that from my dad because I knew my dad loved me with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I'm telling you, I had fear for my dad. But not the fear, I'm scared, I'm afraid. No, no. I understood that my dad had power and authority. And it, and it drew respect out of me from my father. Still to this day, I have respect for my father. My kids get around my dad and they, they know. There's still a fear, something there, that he still walks in at 90 years old. And it isn't because he tries to be the man. The man, No, it's just, the, it's the presence. There's something there. And I know that my dad loved me and he always did. Always expressed that love. He's a very loving, compassionate guy. But he's also, there's something there that I knew that I had great respect and awe of who he was. That's God. That's us understanding the love and the fear of God. And he goes on, notice in this passage that he didn't say perfecting holiness and the love of God. He said the fear of God. The fear of God. Listen again to what Paul says in Philippians 2.12. So this is consistent in his heart. He tells the church at Philippi the very same thing that he told the Corinthian church. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying you're trying to work for, listen, work for your salvation. He's, that we know we can't do that. Salvation is a gift from God because of Jesus Christ, And what he gave us at his death, burial, and resurrection, we put our faith in Jesus. That's what causes us to be born again. You cannot work for your salvation. But what he's saying, work it out. In other words, God did his part. Now you need to do your part. Your part is is receiving this, walking in this. Don't accept anything less, he's saying, than than holiness, than righteousness. Don't, Don't give up in this fight. Work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's something for you to search out and ask God, okay, what does that mean for me? I can't tell you what that means for everybody in the same way, but God will explain that to you. Fear and trembling. The word for trembling is the Greek word tremo or tromos. That's where we get that word tremor or trembling in our language. It means, that word means... Trembling, quaking, or shaking with fear. So the word tremo or tromos means trembling, quaking, 
or shaking in fear. And you can see here by what Paul says that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It means more than just respect or worship. There's an element of awe there that makes you tremble. How many of you, when you go to the edge of the Grand Canyon, or you don't like getting to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and you're looking at that breathtaking view, it causes your legs to shake. Anybody get that besides me? Okay, well, there's two of us that actually are walking in the fear of God. Because if any of you are not shaking and trembling at that sight, we need to pray for you. We have the fear of God. High five. Yeah. <clears throat> so understand that there is a unique perspective. You know, when I was a kid, and lastly this morning I'm going to let you get out of here, is this story I want to tell you. When I was a kid, um, one of my friends that he and I got ourselves into trouble together quite often. His name was Delmer, and uh, funny name, but really, really, really super nice guy. His dad, mom, very committed Christian people like my folks, but his family, they were known as Quakers. And you have to look that up. It's, it's a particular um, sect of Christianity. Their real name was called the Society of Friends, but they were known as Quakers, and the reason that they were known as Quakers, and I'll tell you why in just a moment, when he got his heart right with God before me, he literally, you know, got his heart straight before God and dedicated his life back to the Lord. At their home, they had a little, kind of a little prayer place that they had built that had a few little, like, pews in it, and he would go in there and pray, and he says to me, come on in, come pray with me because he's obviously concerned about my life, my, the way I was living. And he says, I want to pray for you, so come on in my room. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I understand prayer and going to church and all that. And he goes in this room, and he gets down on his knees, and all of a sudden he starts praying and making all this sounds and noise and shaking and trembling all over the place. And I'm like, what's going on with you, man? You know, because he is. He was trembling. Because of this, and the way they got this name, the Quakers, is the founder, his last name was Fox. He believed that what the scripture in Isaiah 66, 5 says, that every single person should tremble at the word of God. They should be in fear at the words of God. When Paul says this, you can see that it's a little more than just respect and worship. There is an element to Paul of holiness and awe when he says to fear the Lord. Hebrews tells us, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. Now, how do we serve God acceptably? That's the question. He said, with reverence and what? Godly fear. So we serve God with reverence, but also godly fear. And why did he say godly fear? Because he said, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. If the fear of the Lord just means reverence, then why did he say reverence and godly fear? Because there's more to it than what you and I think sometimes. This means that there's more to the fear of God than just reverence and respect. So I want to end this morning by giving you a couple of uh, promises to those, the Bible says, who fear the Lord or who have this attitude in their day-to-day decision-making. It says in Psalm 31, verse 19, it says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness. Everybody say abundant. I love this. Oh, how abundant is your goodness which you have stored, here's that word store again, that you have stored up for those who what? Fear you. And work for those who take refuge in you. What a promise. What a promise that God has this 
abundance of goodness stored up for those who here fear him. Psalm 34 and verse 9 says, For the Lord, you, his godly people, it says, Fear the Lord, you, his godly people, for those who fear him will have what? All they need. So God wants to provide everything that we need, but he makes it available to, for those who have this particular attitude. Psalm 111 and verse 10 in the Message Bible says this, I love this, it says, The good life begins where? In the fear of the Lord. Do that and you'll know the blessing of God. Isn't that awesome? Do that and you'll know the blessing of God. So the question today as we leave here, this is the question. Do you fear God? Do you fear God? And when you think about, do you fear God, what's your perspective? God doesn't want you to be afraid of Him or scared of Him, but He does want you to have awe and respect. And just like we gave you the definition of, I want you to meditate through that and think about it and ask God, okay, do I have this attitude in my decision making? Do I have this attitude when I wake up every day? Do I have this attitude in all things in life, because the bottom line is one day you and I will stand before this awesome, powerful, almighty God, the creator of the ends of the earth. We will stand before him. And you're going to experience something that no one has ever experienced. That's something that we can focus on in our life. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, Father, we thank you for showing us a little more about yourself helping us to understand who you are, helping us to realize more of how incredible the gift is and what Jesus has done for us, that we can stand in your presence. And yes, Lord, we need to stand and we need to think about you through this awesome and amazing respect and awe and reverence to you, Lord. But at the same time, help us to understand what it means to fear the Lord. In the way that the writers of the New Testament said, the way that Jesus said, the way Peter and Paul said, Lord, help us to have this attitude in everything that we do. Because we know that when we have this attitude, you look for this so that you can bless us, so that you can use us, so that you can work through us to change the world in which we live. And we give you praise today, Lord, and we thank you for your presence and your kindness and your goodness to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a, a wonderful, wonderful week, and we will see you again soon. See you later.